everyone, this is Gordon Einstein. This is a special, somewhat impromptu Sunday afternoon, a lazy Sunday afternoon version or edition of Crypto Wednesdays. Why is Crypto Wednesdays on a Sunday? I don't know, but I do know because we have a special guest. Special guest, David, introduce yourself. Name, rank, serial number, and we'll go from there. Hey, everybody. Uh, David Johnston. Uh, most people know me for coining the term dApps back in 2013. So decentralized applications is my thing. Uh, been in the crypto scene since about 2012. Uh, before that, built internet companies, biotech companies, uh, AI company, a uh, bunch of different stuff. But, you know, uh, always been a free market economics nerd, as you can tell by F.A. Hayek and other economists behind me. And uh, Actually, yeah, you know what? Well, I have an idea for the show. We should do a show that does a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation through all your background art and posters. There you go. Because it, it kind of pixelates in who you are and what you believe, and each one seems to have a story. Sure. In there. So well, you, you got a lot of good ones, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto riding a honey badger over the moon. I mean, that's that's perfect. Are you in a position to? take that off the wall or bring the camera to that and show it to us? Uh, sure. I'll see if I can unstack my photos here. One second. Okay. No interview has ever gone like this before on Crypto Wednesdays or for David, but you know what? Let's just kind of roll with this stuff. It's all good. Uh, see if we can get the glare out of there. It's a Satoshi riding a honey badger with wow. the defeated fiat currencies, right? With uh, the emblems of the skulls. Then you have Bitcoin being emanated behind the honey badger as it crosses over the moon. I suppose it's the spirit of Satoshi. Spirit so this Satoshi. presumes that he's no longer living, but mm -hmm. you know, he continues on, you know, riding his honey badger steed. And uh, I, th I thought it was a cool thing. So I, I bought it online. Uh, it's one of the original prints, I think, and, you know, put it up on the wall. I, I like it. I, have you seen the movie? I think it's Dr. Sleep. It's the... No. Oh God, we need to align our movie watching. That, 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 that became clear from the pre-conversation and this conversation. So maybe Satoshi's still with us. He's just astrally projecting. Potentially. Let me see if I can restack these suckers. So I've got oh, wait, wait, you're, you're not done yet, my friend. Okay, so the, the cyborg rebel. Yes. So... so this is, I guess, the Bitcoin revolutionary. You know, mm -hmm. it's simply titled Bitcoin. I bought this from a crypto artist at Satoshi Roundtable, uh, one of the years that I went. Yeah, I thought it was really great. It's got the fiat currency burning in the background. Sort mm -hmm. of captures the revolutionary spirit of uh, what we're build building. But, you know, it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's uh, stylish. Yeah, very stylish. And then we have my favorite flag next to it. Ah, uh, good old Switzerland. Yes. You know, we've got uh, anarcho-capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, Ireland, or actually uh, Iceland. Iceland. Why Iceland? Oop, I may have lost your audio. Yep. Can you still hear me? Uh, now I can. So why Iceland? So a thousand years ago uh, or so, they had the first ever parliament, the Thing, has been uh, operating in Ireland, in Iceland ever since. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the first time we got more distributed governance, let's say that. And uh, before that, you've got uh, New Hampshire, the free state, of course. New Hampshire before Iceland. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And then uh, Hayek, tell yep. us. So F.A. Hayek, great influential economist. Uh, I'd say Hayek. I've also got uh, Mises hiding down here in the corner. Mm. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, along with Rothbard, are probably my three big in influences on economics. And that's sort of, you know, what I had gotten into when I got into the Ron Paul campaign in 2007 and 2011. And you go down that rabbit hole. And I was, I was ready by 2012 for when I heard of Bitcoin. So yeah, the, the ground, <laughs> the ground was fertile at that point, right? Well, and, and also because if you remember Second Life, yeah, back in 2006, yeah. I built one of the first investment firms inside of Second Life. And so I had been exposed to virtual currency pretty early on, even pre-Bitcoin. And so, you know, Second Life never really took off, largely because regulators came in with a hammer in mm -hmm. Linden Labs in California. You're like, do you know what people are doing on this platform? There's securities and gambling and all kinds of things. So they effectively mm -hmm. killed sort of all the interesting things that were 
putting uh, Second Life on this great trajectory at the time. Um, and so after that experience, you know, finding Bitcoin in 2012, I was like, ah, open source, not owned by any company, a neutral protocol where all this compliance stuff can get done at the application layer, mm -hmm. right? And it can't, it, it, no company's ever gonna emerge that's going to be able to universally comply with- and Actually, you, you, you dropped a little gem in there. I don't wanna pass it by. You said application stuff could be done, compliance stuff could be done at the application layer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but wait, for everyone watching, this is a completely impromptu interview. We didn't do the pre-show, but I, I know David reasonably well, and I know how his brain works, so I just wanted to seize the moment. So we're gonna go this way and that way and zigzag, but I think the audience is smart enough to keep up as long as I can keep up and I have my coffee here that I'm gonna start sipping in a second. So I unpack the, the needness of having compliance be at the application layer and how that kind of resolved the Linden Labs issue that you saw. So think about the internet and the architecture that we got there. The reason I believe that Tim Berners-Lee um, kindly gave this gift to the world, right, of HTTP. Um, and that being open source, that being um, not copyrighted, not patented, something that everybody could use, ended up creating the larger environment compared to all of the walled gardens that other people tried to build, mm -hmm. right? And so we think about, you know, uh, Bitcoin in, in 2009, is you know here's an open source project you know you look at the precursors of eGold and others they'd all failed largely because they had a central point of failure right and so by removing that central point of failure all of a sudden you open things up for people in their local jurisdiction coinbase can set up and they can get whatever money transmission licenses they need in the us to serve those customers somebody else in europe like smart Valor can get licensed in Liechtenstein and switzerland and serve you know, European customers, everybody can um, treat this innovation in their own context, right? Whereas the protocol itself is agnostic, right? It's just math. It doesn't care where you are. It doesn't know who you are. It's, you know, sending and receiving uh, crypto and just continues to operate. So I, I think- and, and, and I'm sorry, are you sort of making an OSI network stack reference when you say application layer? Is it that tailored? Um, I, I don't know if it has to be that tailored. I'm thinking of more of the general concept, but you know, that's, that's the key, right? That's the key for the innovation and the question. And so what I put forth in, in 2014 was everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. Mm -hmm. So I jokingly said that at uh, coin summit in 2014, me and Vitalik were on stage and I, you know, call that Johnston's law and somebody tweeted it out and it's never stops. <laughs> and so apparently people liked that idea. And, and I think what that really means mm -hmm. is we're trying to move up the tech stack, that neutral part, right? Okay. Right. So the, the internet, you know, these protocols at, at the bottom layer, you know, effectively never moved up, right? We, we don't have a decentralized Facebook or a decentralized Google. We, you know, had traditional, corporate structures be built on top of it. But I think instead what we're seeing in crypto is progressively the open source moving up the tech stack from the protocol layer, then into smart contracts, now into all these decentralized applications with DeFi and everything else. And so piece by piece, we're building a real alternative to the traditional financial infrastructure. And the key is the part that's done by a company keeps moving up right, closer to the user, closer to the UI, the final interface, that white glove service to help people get onboarded. But the actual permissionless and trustless tech is going higher and higher up the stack. And I think that's what people aren't, you know, used to uh, from internet 1.0. Is, is the company part going up the stack or is it narrowing so per, its perception of going up? Like is the bottom of it going up, but the, you know, the the top is, you know, nothing else needs to be done. And that's where you interface with the user. The bottom yeah. is all the infrastructure that lets that happen. Is it actually moving up or is it that the, I'm gonna try to get my hands in the camera, or is it just the bottom is coming up and it's getting more and more narrow as things below it decentralized become open source? Uh, certainly the parts that the user needs help from a company in order to do is becoming more narrow. Um, and, you know, what I think is inevitable is eventually we won't need any companies you'll achieve that dream of peer-to-peer, of -peer, right? Um, even if we look at the history of Bitcoin, right? 
Um, okay, it's a peer-to-peer -peer currency, I can send it to anybody else. But if I look at the transaction volumes, you know, there have been like 900 transactions in the first X number of months of the project, mm -hmm. and then an exchange opened. And boom, you had tens of thousands of transactions moving, right? Because people needed a lot of those interfaces to really make it easy, right? And so what we're seeing is the massive funding of how easy can we make it for the peer-to-peer -peer stuff to get closer and closer to people. But is, is it a little bit ironic in that the, the least somewhat centralized idea of an exchange is what made this decentralized currency explode? And is there anything there? Well, it's just that I'm using that as an example because now we live in a world in which DEXs are a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I funded MasterCoin in 2013, right? When I was running Bit Angels, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, J.R. Willett came to me with this idea, you know, and we, you know, did the research and, and published it out to the community and a bunch of people jumped in. Like, this is when you like had a post on Bitcoin talk. Yeah. And that was your formal announcement. And that was all the information people had. And, you know, we, the, the team at MasterCoin built a DEX on the Omni protocol, which ended up becoming the Omni protocol in, in 2014, 2015, but it moved at the speed of Bitcoin blocks. And, yeah. you know, it was, you know, you could post an order and then somebody could see the order and maybe they can match the order. And now we have Uniswap and you have a billion dollars of liquidity. And now you're finally seeing you know, six years later, the DEXs start to surpass in transaction volume centralized exchanges. Is that purely because of automated market making, AMMs, or did they, was there anything else that let them do that? Oh, it was everything else that let them do that. You needed Ethereum block times, it was a lot faster. Okay, mm -hmm. now I can get finality in 15 seconds. It's a reasonable amount of time to wait. <laughs> I tested that first DEX, right? Waiting 30 minutes for a block, if there's a long block. And then, you probably oh, made some content, another. came back. Made some more right. coffee, came back. You, know? you didn't miss anything, right? So, so you needed the mm -hmm. speed, right? You needed the, the absolutely the bonded curve and you know, ways to incentivize people to add liquidity there. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're bumping up against is the next bottleneck, which is scale. Okay, everybody in the world wants to use a DeFi application or a Uniswap or a synthetic pegged asset, but there's not enough room on Ethereum. Right? And so now you see all the competition coming for, will it be ETH 2.0? Will it be Polkadot? Will it be Cardano? Will it be any of the other competitors that can capture that momentum and give these things proven that people want at scale, right? Without $10 fees, without, you know, three, four or $5 fees that kill the model, mm -hmm. right? So that's effectively the next bottleneck, but we're very close. Like ETH 2.0, it's not that far out. A lot of these main nuts aren't that far out. So it's a very intense competition to see who can scale the tech first. Good times. So let me, let me roll back a little bit. So your Johnson's law that everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. Is that a law? Is that a request? Is it a prediction or is it a suggestion? Is it like, is it an imperative? I think it's an inevitability. And it really, it really is a law. Slash prediction. Yes, and the caveat is everything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. So that's the out, right? If something's not yet decentralized, that means it can't yet be decentralized, right? Sort of going back to moving up the tech stack, like something that's not decentralized today doesn't invalidate that law. It's sort of like, as we go through time, as it can be decentralized, it will be decentralized. That's right? kind of convenient. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a good truism. Okay. <laughs> it's a great truism, right? But I do think about it in the context of something like Moore's Law, right? Which has roughly been, been pretty accurate the last 40 years. Right now, we're coming down to atom level, and we'll see mm. if it's able to continue. Um, but, you know, I think of it in that same context, that same level of inelibility. Now, it doesn't mean centralized systems go, go away. Let's think back to Internet 1.0 with file sharing, right? You had the birth of Napster. Uh, the authorities didn't like Napster. They shut down Napster. Mm -hmm. But things didn't stop. You got BitTorrent. And BitTorrent gave you a huge amount of volume, you know, that can be shared peer-to-peer -peer on do, do I hear a little Bitcoiner in the background? <laughs> oh, yeah. Always. I got, I got three kids already, so. I, I, I got some work to do to catch up to you, buddy. So <laughs> that's another conversation. But congratulations. That's, that's fantastic. So.
the world needs more Bitcoiners. Absolutely, Go ahead. you know, absolutely. They, they had a wallet before they were born. Aww. But uh, but but it's it's the same thing, right? Um, okay, yes, we now have Apple who came in, right, and who really kind of paved the way to ease of use for file sharing, as in they gave a nice way for people to buy, you know, mm -hmm. a song for ninety nine cents. Right? And they created that user interface. And so a lot of people steal that. But BitTorrent hasn't gone away. It's like 20% of the internet volumes. Like it's an enormous use case globally, largely people that don't have the money to spend 99 cents per song. Right? So it's mostly in the developed world as opposed well, I to- think, I think a lot of legit services use BitTorrent, the seeding and, and sharing and everything else as their infrastructure. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be "Quote unquote legal sharing of files." It's Bitcoin any kind of distributed data. Yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't care. It will, you know, distribute any type of file you want. And so, if you're seeding your backend for some file backups, that's just as legitimate as, you know, uh, sharing the next hot Netflix video. Yeah, I mean, I, I could be way off, but I, I get, I get the feeling, or I vaguely remember Assange and WikiLeaks you know, not only dropping the caches of documents with the publishers and having different keys for unloading different sections of the cache, but more broadly seeding it on the internet and having, you know, each part be separate and encrypted. But ultimately, you know, if they've got him out of the Ecuadorian embassy and, you know, he disappeared, he got disappeared. Sure. It was out there one way or another. So, so I bring that up in the context of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. So some authorities like crypto or don't like crypto. Um, and what we've recently seen is some of them like stable coins and some of them don't like stable coins, right? So you had a big reaction to the Libra proposal last year. Yes. The central banks asked the FSB, the Financial Stability Board to go and make a bunch of recommendations, which means regulations that will be implemented by the central banks. Mm -hmm. And that came out earlier this year in April and people gave a bunch of feedback on it, and we're only a month away in October where those regulations are gonna get finalized. And my view is what's gonna happen is you're gonna bifurcate the world. There's going to be the Libras, who now their 2.0 has figured out how to comply with all these regulations. Did I just hear that correctly? The Libras? Like tech bros? <laughs> okay. Libras of the world, right? You know, there's gonna be Libra dollar, and Libra euro, and all these mm -hmm. things, right? Are going to go down this this regulated path and then the only thing that will be outside of that is fully decentralized systems right the bit torrents of the world right <sighs> that's if that's true that's sad um it's it's inevitable right i mean it's, it's just like i say there's no napster but you have BitTorrent and you have apple itunes they're going yeah, to I, I i guess the sadness is the or it's sad for me personally, the, the reason I went back into law after having left this gun tech is I got enthused about, you know, Ukrainian vodka and borscht and sala had a, had a part in it. But mainly I saw that the things I hadn't liked about law and the legal process were potentially addressable by what blockchain unleashed, blockchain and what blockchain unleashed. And I was hoping through my activities to not only as needed bring law to blockchain, but bring blockchain to law in the sense of reform, using it as a tool for reforming our systems. And in my opinion, you know, there's different ways of reforming. You can kind of burn down the farm and build a new farm, you know, burn down the barn and make a new barn or make something other than a barn. You know, and I think we've talked about this. Like you can go the complete revolutionary route and sometimes you got to do that tear down the patriarchy. Well, you know, I'm part of the patriarchy, so I don't want to be torn down, but you, you get my analogy. The, or there's the reform version. You know, reform doesn't mean destroy and rebuild. Reform means take the form of an existing thing and change it. You know, there's, there's different words for when you're not doing that. You know, when well, you- I think you're going to get both, right? You're, you're inevitably going to get both, right? I don't see any reason that, yes, law will be digitized. That's what we're really talking about, is having smart contracts. Uh, there's a great project, uh, Lexon. Oh, 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 just let me get across the finish line because I, I want to pick your brain on the response. The, the, way, the way I heard the, your Libros comment and the completely unregulated comment is that there's two islands separated widely, 
without touching. And I, I, I kind of like this shallow middle zone where they fight and new things can come out where things, regulation adapts to what's coming out and what's coming out adapts to regulation, but there's a sort of Hegelian thesis, antithesis, synthesis process going on that hopefully propels us to a better place. If it's all unregulated or if it's all just a digital version of compliance with the rules that are there, to me, that makes me a little bit sad because we're missing that, you know, synthesis evolution center part in the middle. But maybe you have a different point of view. No, I, I agree. And I would say it depends on where you live. Sure. So different jurisdictions are going to allow more real innovation to seep into the reform of the legacy system mm -hmm. than others will. And it's pretty easy to tell which ones are going to embrace it. Those with the most to lose from you know, uh, reform will most urgently, <laughs> urgently and, and ardently- uh, Yeah, you know, I, I caught that word and that, that's actually a good new word. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll most urgently uh, you know, dissuade people. So you have you know, the laws in New York, mm -hmm. right? You had the bit license in, in 2014, and that effectively shut down all of the Bitcoin companies, exchanges, people that wanted to operate in New York, and they all went somewhere else. Right? Mm -hmm. They went to California, or they went to Switzerland, or they went to Singapore, but they went somewhere else, right? And so the existing incumbent can play that game, but really for only so long, right? Um, because what happens is if, if they play that game too hard, they get displaced, right? And so now they're, you know, slowly, ah, we'll give out a couple of licenses. Like it was years before anybody got a bit license. Like it was, it was a joke. You needed tens of millions of dollars. The regulations were higher than if you were a bank, you know, effectively no startups could get it, right? And so most people just blocked the state of New York for years, I still go onto websites and it's like, sorry, we can't serve certain jurisdictions, New York, North Korea, Iran, there's States. some places you can't do business, right? And it's like, okay, that, that tells you, you know, sort of what's missing. Um, so we've got friendly places like Switzerland, which just, I guess it was yesterday, you know, unanimously in the Swiss Senate passed the new Blockchain Act, Blockchain Law, um, that, you know, codifies all the friendly regulations that they had already been sort of putting out there and put those, those into law. So there's competition. Um, but I don't think you can be in the wrong jurisdiction and say, well, you know, hopefully they'll get around to it one day. That's sort of like saying, well, one day, you know, Kazakhstan is going to have the next Google. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not, right? And there's a bunch of structural reasons around their regulations that they're not, right? The reason it happened in California had a lot to do with US free speech and the first wave of the internet being about media and words and content. And mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of you know, incumbent resistance to the internet 1.0 unless you lived in a jurisdiction where there were controls on media and content and language and free speech. Well, not to mention the internet 1.0 was a government project designed to help us withstand a nuclear attack. I'm talking about the DARPA net. The, yeah, if you go all the, the way ARPANET. back to the, if you go all the way back to the ARPANET, I guess that's true, but I don't really consider that the internet. The internet wasn't, oh, I can connect some nodes and I have a transport layer for uh, these protocols. It would have been, it would have continued to be uninteresting and irrelevant to most people if it weren't for HTTP, right? It's, to, oh. it's, like, it's like drawing the distinction between you know, yes, there were attempts at virtual currency. None of them were really interesting mm. until Bitcoin, not because it had a radically uh, different technology that it used. It used existing pieces, but it took out that central point of failure, right? And put together a peer-to-peer -peer network, a blockchain ledger, you know, the ability for the token to incentivize people to do the mining activity. You All know, right, so I'm going to do the normal Crypto Wednesday's contentious style, which is I'm going to argue back a little bit. Go for it. Okay, the, um, I, I, I'm going to distinguish those cases from my point of view. The TCP, IP, DNS, FTP, you know, all of, I, you know, um, UDP, all those base technologies were apps are were and are absolutely key for the present functioning of the internet. They were completely 
inspired by the need to have a system that would be resilient against a few nukes going off at different places around the country to perceive damage. And to, you know, like Vitalik says, you know, the internet sees censorship as damage and routes around it. Well, but that's, I, he didn't even have to get that esoteric. Yes, it was designed to, to see right. nuclear strikes, you know, the ultimate Byzantine general's problem and route around it. And the, the development of BSD Unix, the involvement of all these universities, like everything else was US ARPA funding. And the, you know, it was the ARPANET. And you know, it was kind of a re when the government decided that it needed a really military centered internet as opposed to the more slightly more public one with the universities, that's when the internet was born. And all those things, we use them every day. It's like Bit BitTorrent, it, it's so ubiquitous and built in, we don't even think about it. And sure. yes, the, the time it came alive, including for me, like, you know, I was never around, I wasn't using, I was aware of Gopher, you know, and all this other stuff, I never used Gopher. You know, it, it all came alive for me with Netscape and the browser. And what did, you know, what did that mean? That it need the HTTP. That's the, the magic of it. But I'd say, unlike the prior digital currency attempts, which were worthwhile experiments, but ultimately are not part of the infrastructure now, these things we live and breathe them every day. You and I are communicating over it right this very second, right? Voice and, over internet protocol, right? Yeah, and, and God <laughs> bless them. You know, God, <laughs> with, with God bless them. RFCs, RFC yeah. one, RFC two. You know, here's the definition of a host. Here's the definition of a packet, like all that, you know, we're still yeah. living that right this second. So I, I, I guess I would distinguish And, and yes, it, the internet blossomed when the, the stack worked its way up to HTTP and all this other stuff, but the iceberg is deep. So that's, yeah. that's my thought. <laughs> Absolutely. Though, though I think what I'm reacting to is like, as if like the government intended for these outcomes when they developed the, the ARPANET, right? They had oh, their own purpose. Surely not. No, <laughs> surely, but, but I don't know if anyone did. You know, I don't know, I don't know if Tim Berners Lee- How can you predict a dynamic system? Like you can't. Yeah, yeah which is kind of the beauty of it, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the beauty of DARPA projects and, and government funded innovation, wherever it is, when it's done right, is if it, you know, the Apollo program is they, they have a mission, that mission's big and ballsy, but then the, the results of that mission are more or less free for others to adopt, hack and reassemble, make into new things. When they do it and it's closed, yep. the results aren't available for that. You know, yeah, we may accomplish something awesome. You know, hey, you know, you know big step for mankind, all that, but it doesn't have the knock-on effect. Right, and unfortunately, a large portion of government spending, I would say, is in that category of not offering positive externalities to the world. Right? We spend a trillion dollars a year on, on military budgets in, in the U.S., you know, uh, right. if you include sort of the ancillary budgets that support uh, the military. I know it's officially seven or eight hundred billion, but, you know, if you add up the other programs, it's I think it's closer to a trillion. And so, mm -hmm. you know, um, to say that we've had some, you know, nice benefits of some side research, I think, the the harm done by government spending so far dwarfs the positives that I'm <laughs> really hesitant to offer them any credit for the side effects of unintended consequences of the technologies that they created. I mean, even Tim, where was he? CERN. He was in CERN, which yeah. is in Switzerland. It's in Geneva, right? And or just outside Geneva, right? So you know, but, I but mean, it is a government-funded project. It's multiple government-funded, and he was doing a side project that didn't have a lot to do with sir. <laughs> it is part-time and telling his sure. boss, like, "Hey, I think this is interesting." He's like, "Yeah, whatever, go for it." <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I, I, I feel like I know you well enough that I can banter back and forth in this. May, may, may I do so? Sure. Okay. So, look, I, I'm. I, th I think you're making a libertarian argument, and I think it's a good argument, and I generally agree with it. I'm just, I'm just going to argue some edge case stuff without challenging the central premise. Okay, I, I, I agree that individual actors, whether market or otherwise, are responsible for the majority of innovation, and they probably create that innovation at a much, you know, much less burdensome way than governments do. So I, I, I will. Concede if I need to concede, but I'll agree on that point. Uh, I think that some, I think you and I talked about this actually, you know, it's, in fact, I know we did. So we, this is a good bridge to like freedom and everything else. I think some things 
uh, are of such scale that they can be only accomplished with an element of coordination slash coercion so that the proper or the necessary concentration of uh, resources and time is achievable. So Manhattan Project, you know, good or ill, I don't see private entrepreneurs, you know, coming up with the A-bomb for a long, long, long time. You know, I don't see landing on the moon for a long, long, long time. I don't see pyramids, which may not be a good thing. You know, I don't see the three quarters dam. You know, so some things, whether they're good or bad, I think requires, you know, even if you set, even if you have a market, even if you have rules, even if you have people able to create wealth under those rules, there's the, the, the nature, some, some projects are just so externality oriented that no one individual or individual group will have the incentives to do it, but they sh when they're done in the aggregate, they produce enough externalities in the aggregate that they produce a benefit. Those projects may, may not be common, but I think they exist. And I, and I think the moon landing is maybe one of those. So what's your, so so, that, that edge case only. I'm like, I'm conceding the general principle that generally doesn't work, but I think sometimes, you know. Well, go ahead. I, I, I would agree with your assessment. Only well, then in, the interview's over, what the hell? I, mean, I agree with your assessment in the sense that yes, you can have extreme outcomes when you have extreme concentration of power and wealth. That's what you're describing. Like the Soviet Union will spend a trillion dollars for its aggrandizement and build a statue that's taller than any statue that's ever existed. Well, I'm gonna add something there. It is power, wealth, and a sort of purpose beyond immediate material gain because if you just have an immediate material gain you're you're a large you know William Gibson type type conglomerate right I'm talking about but, I'm talking about a sort of a, 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 something that stands outside of a capitalist system and can sure. spend money on things that don't produce necessarily their economic right. returns you for can them. build you can dig the world's largest hole yes in Russia they've, they've dug the world's largest hole yes. and you could build the highest statue and you can, you know, crush millions of people and extract their productive wealth and do ridiculous projects that cost way more than anybody could justify. But the question is, so what? Like, yes, you can do terrible things and steal enormous amounts of money from a large number of people in the context of a nation state and create some extreme externality that's usually the expression of like the personality of the dictator or the interests of the particular bureaucrats that have hold on that purse, right? You know, and you know, you could say if you look at the history of the, the Soviet space program, and it was an outbirth of you know the interests of the engineers that didn't just want to build missiles; they wanted to be the first ones, mm -hmm. you know, to go space, right? And they kind of convinced the Soviets, oh, this would be a good way to test it all. And you know, the Soviets didn't really care; they're like, yeah, yeah, just get the missile done, right? But you know, okay, yes, you can get those extreme examples, but is that good. I don't think normally or in any case I can think of that's been a positive. Let's take the example of extracting huge amounts of gold via conquistadors in South America or Central America versus the humble farmers of, of North America, you know, the guy, you know, growing potatoes in Minnesota, you know, one created a stable society of much better wealth distribution, right, as opposed to, you know, a noble or conquer own society, right? And yes, you could build pyramids down here, but you had something that turned into a global, you know, behemoth of real economic activity in manufacturing and all these other things over time up here, right? So I think governance is possibly the most overlooked and the most important thing in the world. The governance, when I think about governance, I'm talking about the incentives, the economic systems that allow more or less freedom. And I think about it on a scale. And the closer you are to the individual being able to direct his own resources and free to take his own actions, the more prosperous society is. It doesn't matter where it is, doesn't matter what language they speak, it doesn't matter any of that context. All that matters is did they have that freedom? And if so, a Hong Kong pops out of the ground, right? Or a London pops out of the ground, mm -hmm. or a New York pops out of the ground, right? And if you lack any of that freedom. Or, or Shanghai. Yeah, or Shanghai. Um, and you know, if you well, I, I kind of, I kind of was a little bit throwing a wrench there, which I'm sure you picked up on. No, or, I don't. Or think Shanghai. It's a wrench at all. I don't think it's a wrench at all. 
Okay. You look but then at it was a, it was a it was an attempted wrench. Go ahead. So. Well, if you look at the economic, when did Shanghai pop out of the ground? Uh, late seventy. Well, when Deng Xiaoping started his experiment, and well, actually it was Guangdong, but then Guangdong was getting too much power, so they brought up Shanghai because they wanted to offset it. So I say really All the eastern started in the coastal 80s. cities. They opened up the charter cities, right? You know, in the economic special zones, right? Mm -hmm. And that's to my point. Shanghai was nothing before the economic reforms. It was literally rice paddies. Like you look at um, Pudong today. Oh, 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 right? so river, I'm, I'm not making the argument that capitalism doesn't generally produce everything we're talking about. I think we're aligned. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm really just sticking on the niche case of moonshots. But was the moonshot good? I'm a space nerd. I'm all in favor of moonshots. I've been, you know, over the moon, pun intended, yeah. about space since I was a little kid, right? But looking back, okay, we got there 50 years earlier than we now sort of with economic incentives and modern technology can get there for a fraction of the cost, right? Dollar inflation adjusted. The cost to put person on the moon is now a tiny Sorry, fraction. but I, I, I'm going to make the internet argument. The, the reason Elon Musk can even dream this in 2020 is because Kennedy dreamt of it in the 60s. I don't think Kennedy's dream and the aggrandizement of the US over, over the Soviet Union enabled much of it at all. If that was true, then the SLS would have been completed and NASA's efforts to get people to the moon would have prospered, but they haven't because of poor centralized planning, poor organization, uh, all of the things that have prohibited any sort of innovation. I don't know if you know a lot about the space industry, but they're literally not the last 40, 40 years, they've not been allowed to make a new engine. Yeah. Because the existing engine worked and they didn't want any failures. So just stop all innovation, use that existing engine. So rocketry became what can you jam the existing uh, components into in order to do something new? And the answer was not a lot. Right. And so you needed somebody who had a much greater degree of, of freedom because of his wealth to come in and say, no, I'm, I'm going to make the new engine. Right, and I'm going to throw out the old book, and I'm going to build an entirely new one, and we're going to have a lot of failures, and that's okay. And right? would, would that throwing out the book been possible without the book? I don't know how helpful the book was. You started from scratch. You rebuilt the engines. Yes, was there useful science and technology created by NASA? Absolutely. Was it dollar for dollar more efficient than? what the market would have derived without hundreds of billions of dollars of government spending, I, I don't think that's a very compelling case in the least. Uh, and, and, by the way, and I agree with you, but again, I'm making a sort of a counter economic argument, which is dollar for dollar, almost always these big government initiatives are not as efficient, but it's more like the fact that it's even being spent on this at all. Whereas in some, in often, private enterprise wouldn't necessarily spend on it. Well, sure, but NASA was largely conceived and continued for decades as a jobs program. We want a lot of jobs to be created over as many uh, congressional districts as humanly possible. And Texas, Alabama, Florida, whole Space Coast, right, was an industry and, and it spread from there like, oh, we're gonna get that part from Minnesota. Why? Well, we need that guy's vote, right? And you got so spread out and inefficient that the shuttle, which they were hoping to launch once a week, would launch two times a year, and it would cost you half a billion dollars every time it launched, right? And so, yes, you can push forward an outcome that would have taken uh, longer in sort of a natural time scale, but I don't know if, again, I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know if that's useful. You know, the, the Soviets, if they created the world's largest submarine that never would have been built if it weren't for their desire to shove more nukes in a submarine, like, I don't know if that's useful for humankind, right? Um, and, and this is sort of the same context is, you know, what economists really think about is, you know, people have all these different motivations. And just because, you know, you aggregated them together and created a rocket ship instead of you know, a million more people being able to afford a car, it might have been better for those million people to have a car and transportation and economic opportunity and a job and all the rest. So economics is, is, I love the study of the, the uh, unseen, 
right? Because what everybody sees is the outcomes. What you don't see is what's missed because of that outcome. I, I agree that there's always the alternative universe where a different decision was made and to merely for our points of view upon what's in front of our noses. But we live in that universe. world. We live in that universe because yeah. of the jurisdictional differences. And you can see the choice that was made in one jurisdiction and the outcome. And you can see the choice in a different yeah. jurisdiction. You can see the outcome. We've got a beautiful experimental lab of governance that runs all the time in all of these jurisdictions. And what I love about crypto is mm -hmm. it's now amplified because every one of these crypto blockchains are sovereign in their own sense. And people are running different governance experiments constantly now at a massively accelerated pace. So I, I was going to push back about your each country's different jurisdiction thing because of the level of impact that they all have on each other. But I love and appreciate the idea that, yes, you're right, each blockchain is really its own jurisdiction. And you're getting to the sort of biological evolutionary genetic algorithm of them battling each other out to see what's more efficient, what's more adopted, what evolves faster. And you're right, it, it, it's, it's, it's like, it's finally, it's a beautiful thing. Sure. Right. Well, and that's the thing I love is I don't have to um, really worry or, or think a lot about um, traditional nation state stuff anymore. Like, I don't care how many dollars the Federal Reserve prints. I took all my dollars and traded them for Bitcoin. And I'm never going back. Right. I may turn that Bitcoin into Ether or the Ether into Dash or the Dash into something else, but I'm not going to go backwards, right? I'm not going to go back to printing letters and signing them and sending them through the post office once I've discovered email, right? So, you know, Great that's the thing yeah. that's interesting to me. That's the thing that's interesting is now we live in an entirely different universe and you have diff I, I, I love the description of Ethereum and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an experiment that put puts forth scarcity creates more demand, right? The scarcity of the Bitcoin unit and it creates people's demand for it. And Ethereum being an experiment where demand creates scarcity. Mm. The usage, and those are the two major economic experiments being currently run in parallel. And it's not clear whether either of them is wrong. They may well be right in their own context. Uh, yeah, they, they're not, they're doing different things. So they're maybe, fundamentally they, different things. So it is funny way to describe it. Oh, completely. Yeah, it's, it's clever. I appreciate it. Um, Credit to whoever's tweet that one. <laughs> you know, there's, that anonymous tweeter changed my life. Man. Probably Eric Voorhees or Roger or one of the other guys. Yeah, yeah so. interesting. Um, so you, you have a keen, I mean, we, we've talked about this, you have a keen interest in freedom and you're, back, sorry, I, I got to make one other point on the other one. And this kind of contradicts what I said. Okay. Is he counting, by the way, I'm not, I'm not like banging the table on a certain position. It's more like I, I struggle with these ideas. So there's an argument. I, I guess a counter argument to what I was throwing out there is, yes, we may not accomplish the great, the certain great things, and I'm doing air quotes on that, mm -hmm. in the time that we would accomplish them if everything was left up to their own devices, because no individual incentives for an economic creature would cause them to do it then, whether it's, whether it's dig the hole or prepare for the Nazi invasion or shoot for the moon. But there, there is the other argument, which is, okay, suppose that money were circulating freely in the system or those resources were circulating freely in the system and people were doing what they do with them, which is consuming them, investing them and creating more wealth, hopefully. There's the Deng Xiaoping uh, phrase, which is, you know, first get rich, then everything else will be easy. So maybe the idea is that if you let the economy grow to its own devices and don't impose these commands on it, that it scales to such a point that the moonshot becomes a trivial rounding error within there. Right. And then the Elon Musk, maybe not in 2020, but in 2030, does it for laughs. Right. Or yeah. because, or maybe in the 20 hundred, maybe in 2010 does it for laughs because so much money was reinvested in the real economy that there's so much spare that they're like, it's, it's and, trivial. It's like, oh yeah, I feel like going to the moon. Build and I agree with your point, that was the end of the Cold War, is the Soviet Union was spending something like 25 or 50 percent of their entire GDP just trying to keep up with the United States, and the United States is moving its little finger, here's 
two to four percent of my GDP, no big deal. Mm -hmm. I'm 16 size the 16 times the size of your economy, mm -hmm. right? And the same thing today. Here's South Korea, eminently prosperous, and you know have very modern defense systems, and you have these little puppet state next to it, and mm -hmm. it's trying to keep up expending every possible resource, massively oppressing its population. And which one is sustainable, right? Which one wins over time? Everybody knows the outcome. You could have known the outcome because of the economic disparity between the US and the Soviet Union. One, eventually one would collapse and, and the other would continue, right? And so now we're seeing the same thing play out with crypto and with fiat. Okay. Massively successful, massively profitable, innovations coming out like literally every week there's a new DeFi project doing some and 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 you know people a lot of knock it because oh well, there's some scams and stuff like that but there's some really good innovation being done by really serious projects it's not just you know the audit mark automated market making it's everything that's now been built on top of that right to try to share fees with the users and tokenize the whole thing you know and so we're seeing a rate of innovation that would take decades, if it oh, ever happened doubt, at yeah. all in their traditional system. And so you have a brain drain mm -hmm. from the smartest people over here and Wall Street and everywhere else have been moving over now for a decade into crypto and blockchain. And the outcome is obvious, right? And so the only the question left is how much of the economy will move over, probably everything in one form or another, but you're going to have a a uh, decentralized version where there is no intermediary, the BitTorrent, and you're going to have the Libra, which is gonna be for a lot of people super convenient and low cost and all these things. It's not gonna get them out of fiat. They're still gonna have exposure to dollars, right? Because the regulators have captured the Libra model and said, you have to use our fiat, right? That's the evolution of 2.0. Now there's Libra dollars and Libra euros. They got rid of the basket for most of the major co countries, right? And now the basket, in the form that it still exists is only like government securities and cash mm -hmm. as def <laughs> they've invited i kid you not the imf to come and regulate the basket of libra right well, that's not as potentially weird as it sounds just because of the special drawing rights yeah yeah it's it kind is of an analogous. implementation of two billion people being able to use that basket though the larger nation states have asserted their dominance and said but we get the dollar and we get the euro and you know, it's the everybody else is going to get the basket, right? And so, and, mm -hmm. and and Libra has said, hey, if if you come out with a central bank digital currency, we'll be happy to include you in your nation-specific non-basket currency, right? So this creates the race for all the central banks to meet that threshold. <laughs> Interesting time. So let me let me shift over. So. Pegnet, I've, I've, mean, I've meant to ask you about that for a long time. Give us the scoop. This is effectively an outgrowth of what we've just been talking about. What would it look like if there was a fully decentralized system for pegging real world values on a blockchain? Mm -hmm. And so last year in August, uh, miners started mining the Pegnet uh, system and reporting Oracle prices for gold and silver, the top 20 fiat currencies, the top 20 cryptos. And they've created something I think that's really special, which is a system that has no reserve. It has no collateral. It has no middleman or intermediaries. The user can place value into PegNet. They take some peg, the native token. They can burn it and mint an equal amount of peg dollars or peg gold peg ether, whatever they want, mm -hmm. and move that around the system for a tenth of a penny. And there's no slippage because they're not trading with somebody else. They're effectively rebasing their peg based on the Oracle prices at the moment. So whatever the price of, you know, Ethereum. And, and, and I'm sorry, explain to me, I think my catch, how are the Oracles established and how is their accuracy validated or insured? So in the same way that Bitcoin incentivizes miners mm -hmm. to process transactions, um, Pegnet incentivizes miners, now stakers, to report Oracle prices. So they can call any API they want. Most of them use like a, a CoinGecko or a 
coincap.io or coinmarketcap. There's all these APIs available. Mm -hmm. The community has actually developed its own now, pegnetmarketcap.com. And so there's all these APIs they can pull from and the miners are distributed all over the world. I don't know who they are, right? And they can pull in those Oracle prices, they can publish them to the chain. And if they have enough hash power or the stakers ha hold enough peg, they get a reward every mm -hmm. block. And so it's purely based on economic incentives, right? Why do people keep mining Bitcoin? Because they want the Bitcoin, right? It's the same thing here. People are staking peg or they're mining peg. Mm -hmm. And the outcome is these secure oracles, right? Okay. And what that gives you is how do you build a stable coin where there's no reserve? Because the reserve is the central point of failure. Right? It's like, how do you build Bitcoin without becoming e-gold? Mm -hmm. right? You had to rip out the central point of failure. Right? So they've done effectively the same thing using oracles instead of a reserve and instead of pooled collateral. You know, there's no pooled collateral to hack. There's no honeypot for somebody to come in and try to grab the ether or something out of the smart contract. Everybody has the tokens in their own wallet. They're not and by the way, that, that seems to be the recurring thing. Anytime there's a concentration, even in DeFi, which I find ironic, yeah, you know, the, that seems to be the thing. Like whether it's the sushi chef, you know, moving his tokens up and then back in to his credit, or the central issue with the yam, you know, that they apparently are fake. By the way, I guess one little comment. You know, the, the, all, all the comments that people make about the scams in DeFi, I'm just. I mean, there surely are scams, but I'm seeing a lot of more what I would describe as teething issues. Mm. You know, it, it's like the, the I don't think the sushi chef gent was wrong for pulling out his tokens. I was allowed, and those were the rules of the game. And then he changed his mind and he put him back in. I mean, because he's like, well, sorry. It's like, oh, you know, that's more like human. I don't think what he did was wrong legally. Now, I'm kind of putting my lawyer glasses on, but I don't think it was wrong ethically necessarily. I mean, the part part of the if you, if you believe code is law and that, or code should be law or law should be code, which is actually closer to what I think. Sure. The, if you truly believe that it's incumbent upon you to live with it. And yes, and dur and during this development phase, understand that it's not going to be perfect and there's going to be problems and to separate problems caused by people being bad actors with problems from it wasn't done right. Honestly, I, I, I feel like you, now you want to push back and send me straight to so go for it. No, I completely agree. Um, and, and I would characterize it as the old security versus convenience. Mm -hmm. It is harder to build a fully decentralized system. The Pegnet community spent a year getting robust oracles built and they had to learn a ton of things from people that tried to attack the system, right? And they put them all into a Pegnet 2.0 version and they just rolled that out a few weeks ago, which added staking, which is a balance against the bad miner, mm -hmm. right? And they now the code detects for spikes because sometimes the APIs just go haywire, right? You gotta be able to detect erroneous data. Mm -hmm. And so that's all learning, right? But it would have been easier to copy and paste somebody else's smart contract and put a different logo on it and hold all the keys yourself. That's easier, but that's not long-term. Right. What's long term is people that put in the work to build real robust decentralized systems. And here's the effect of more than a billion dollars of assets have moved across the pegnet rails. Because when you can pay a tenth of a penny to trade, you trade a lot, right? Effectively, every block, every 10 minutes, every day, people are converting value on pegnet. And so we see massive usage, right, of the network. And as the oracles get stronger, and the stakers enter the system, which adds an incentive for liquidity in the system, which is the key, I think you're gonna see more and more adoption. And, and so I think that's the long-term play. Like you said, we're gonna learn from all these experiments that people run and we're gonna, the serious people are gonna build robust systems. But I think in the case of the sushi chef, it was more violating social norms, right? Yeah, people wanted a Satoshi who would stick around for a long time and, you know, iterate on the thing and at the end of the day, take nothing, right, uh, from the system. But in reality, people need resources to build, right? Ethereum took a 7% grant effectively, right, the Ethereum Foundation to help build the code. 
Um, and it wouldn't be where it is today without that, right? So there's this tension in the community between the ideal of full decentralization and needing people to be properly resourced. My argument today is the same it was when I talked with Vitalik in late 2013. We were talking about how to structure, because originally he just wanted to do hashing, mm. right? Just miners, nothing else. He said, look, there are effectively three demographics. Mining had already become very industrialized. The average guy wasn't gonna get any ether mining, right? But anybody with capital, if they could donate to the foundation and get some tokens, now you have a huge community of people. And the other thing they did really well was reward developers. Everybody that contributed a line of code to the Ethereum GitHub got Ether in the Genesis block. They vastly rewarded lots of developers. And who has the biggest developer network today? It isn't surprising that it's Ethereum. And I think those three demographics continue to be the driving force. Like, are you incentivizing people who have capital, whether it's liquidity mining or something else? Are you you know, uh, rewarding those people that are securing the network, either as validators or miners, and are you rewarding the people that are writing the code? And so that's a big point of debate, right? There's going to be a hard fork of, of uh, Bitcoin Cash in November over this debate, right? One group wants to have a dev reward, the other one doesn't, and more power to them. They have the freedom to choose what they think is best, but I think over time, those with developer resources that are given by the protocol will be less susceptible to take over because what you really see is a lot of development and teams get bought out by a company or an mm -hmm. investor, right? And all of a sudden it becomes their protocol, right? So if you want- well, I'm gonna put my foot right, I'm gonna put my foot right in it and you can back off it if you want. And I know some of the people involved, I like them. Is, is Blockstream an example of that? Uh, you said it. Okay. <laughs> but any- Just you can, asking, <laughs> yeah. I was actually thinking of more more recent examples, um, like you had, you know, Justin acquire, you know, yeah. uh, the the blogging platform, right? And the community rose up and say, "Hey, we don't really, you know, want one guy controlling this thing." And they created an alternative, and that's that's wonderful, right? That's that's what I love about crypto is voice or exit. You have both available to you. So let me let me ask you this, and here's another. I guess this shows all about my struggles. Here's another thing I I struggle with, which is. I appreciate, I understand and I appreciate the ability to fork and the option to fork, whether it's in software or government, or I, don't, I think it goes beyond software, let me put it that way. And there's a Darwinian element to it that I think if, they, if it doesn't keep people honest, at least introduces honesty thoughts into their mind. <laughs> but by, by definition, every time you fork, you're atomizing a community, unless every single person goes over to the new fork, which is not really a fork. And a little bit to the point we were going at earlier, some things require sufficient resources and sufficient eyeballs to pr propel forward into space. Yeah. And, and part of me wants there to be one in Bitcoin that everyone's working on to make it better than a million different versions. And I, and I, I said, part of me, right? You know, yes, I get the Cambrian aspect of what's going on. I get it. I really do get it. But I also yearn for, you know, the, the segue thing to have not cause everyone to like shit their pants. And it, I know you got some feelings about that, you know, and for everyone just kind of, you know, pulling oars in the same direction because the, to me, the bigger play is blockchain and crypto generally. And I'm not sure that all this forking activity produces the most net results as opposed to all of us aligned to a certain extent. But I, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm right in some cases, and I don't know what to do about it, even if that was the case. So I view forking as events that happen when no compromise is possible. So I wrote in 2016, embrace the coming Bitcoin fork, mm -hmm. right? Me Medium article. Yeah, I know so it was very clear to me. It was I, very I clear. I walking right into it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's very clear to me that like the two sides were ir irreconcilable because mm -hmm. they believed Bitcoin was different things. Fundamentally, like they, you know, one side believed it was digital gold and one believed it was digital cash. And the functionality required of the software could not coexist. Mm -hmm. And effectively you had a fork before that. 
Vitalik started by making proposals to the Mastercoin Foundation to build scripting on Bitcoin. Yes. The devs told him that ain't going to happen. Not the Mastercoin devs, but the, you know, uh, the Bitcoin devs that told him that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? You're not putting that stuff on here. And he said, okay. And he, he went off and built something else, right? Mm -hmm. Which became Ethereum. And so really it had already been happening long before the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash fork is anybody that couldn't fit inside of the ideological tent of Bitcoin had to go outside and build their own tent, mm -hmm. right? To me, this is Catholicism versus Protestantism, right? If, if you couldn't live inside the canon and the governance structure of the, the bishops and everything else, then you had to create an alternative. And now we've seen Protestantism, you know, fracture into many different camps. Like even during the Reformation, you know, Lutherans and, you know, all these, uh, these different flavors, and that's okay. They can't build as large and fancy a building in Vatican City as the monopoly, mm -hmm. but I believe they probably do more good for humanity in the form of charity and local work. And I'm involved in, in my local church and they're helping homeless people and they're you know, giving, you know, to single moms and like just all the amazing things that they do. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that there's no permission required from a hierarchy for somebody to go and do that good work that they can just do it. Right. And, and so I think the, the, the breaking up or atomizing is actually a positive. Mm -hmm. You know, if you asked uh, Jefferson, you know, how to improve governance, he said, well, divide the parishes into wards as in decentralized, hmm. decentralized, decentralized. These are not new questions, right? And we just keep That's coming on right. them again for every new technology. And I think we will we'll benefit the most if you have the most innovation and flexibility. So more power to the people. The, the best thing that ever happened to the Bitcoin was the fork. It ended the toxicity, it ended the civil war. People that wanted one version got to go and build it. And the people that wanted the other version got to go and build it. That's a good thing. All right, so I, I, just to be, it's funny, I'm going to say devil's advocate and Catholic church in the same paragraph. So <laughs> read into that what you will. So my, my, I guess my devil's advocate on that is true. You, you do have that decentralized, you know, thousand, you know, blooming of a thousand schools of thought in Protestantism. You also have, you know, the Catholic church moving maybe slowly or ponderously, but when it has Vatican I and Vatican II, it is a massive shift of a whole bunch of people, barring Mel Gibson and his dad, who, who flip at, en masse to an updated system more or less coherently. And you know, if you look at the, the length of the church since Paul to the present, you know, to accomplish in the, in the mere 60s, that kind of doctrinal change for, for such a large group you know, besides for a few traditional hangouts, it, it, you know, there, there's something there too. So yes, it was great when Lincoln um, put out the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad he did. And it was a step forward in human rights. That doesn't make it great that the U.S. didn't have emancipation for many of its residents for all of that time since its founding until the proclamation. Yes, it's great the proclamation happened, but the violent institution that kept people subjected into slavery, I don't think should be lauded because they finally reformed their terrible behavior mm -hmm. a hundred and, you know, X number of years later, right? So, you know, that's, that's what it comes back to for me is like, okay, you know, people like, oh yeah, we finally got that freedom. Yes, who was the one oppressing you? Oh, the people that gave you that freedom. <laughs> like, come on, guys. That's an interesting you had argument. those freedoms. You had those rights. There was an institution that was taking them from you. And I'm glad that institution finally got reformed. Doesn't mean I want to live inside that institution. Yeah, and, you know, rumor has it that, you know, Gal Galileo is not a heretic. I, I know it's a, a you know, breakthrough news here. I know, <laughs> right? And But that just keeps happening. So, that was the beauty of Bitcoin. and goes back to our point about being jurisdiction agnostic. I didn't have to convince 51% of the US population in an election that I should be allowed to buy Bitcoin. Because we live in a jurisdiction where I had enough other unrelated rights of free speech and I could access the internet and technology. I just did it. I did it in 2012 
before FinCEN even offered any guidance in March of 13. Like with entirely lack of any federal guidance whatsoever, I said, this is a positive thing. It'll help the world. I'm going all in. And, and I was allowed to do it. There are jurisdictions where people still can't buy crypto today because the majority of people haven't flipped over and the monolith hasn't decided they can. So let me, let me throw this at you. The, and, I, and again, this is a little Gordon personal, but it, it's being brought up by everything you're saying. The, I, I think maybe emotionally or spiritually, I like the idea of people working in groups and accomplishing things and moving forward. Like that has an attraction to me. Like I, 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 I my heart goes out to the straggler. You know, I, I want humanity to work together, all that other stuff. There's kind of that feeling. It's almost like a teenager type feeling. Maybe it's a little innocent. There, there's also the, you know, as someone who's, believe it or not, you know, not, not 12 anymore and who has to make a living and support a marriage and work on interesting projects and be healthy and doesn't have endless time in, in real life. I, I, I can't wait for everyone to agree to do stuff. Yeah. Because I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the resources. I mean, I just don't. You, even even though I was Kamal out of Turk or, you know, one of these superhumans who can do everything and, you know, work all night and just slay and, you know, still have a life. I don't know how these people do it. It's like there, there's not enough, there's not enough Gordon to, to change the direction of the Catholic Church by myself in my lifetime it, to like reach the right results. I, I, can't, I can't push through Vatican III, whatever that would look like. You know, I, you know and obviously I'm, with the last name Einstein, I'm kind of choosing a different lane, but uh, you know, or, you know, I'm not, I'm not in a position to reform all these things. I can throw my voice in the conversation like, you know, we're doing now, but fundamentally, I just need to pick something to work, pick one thing and work on it. And if I was waiting for permissions and gatekeepers and everyone else to say, okay, just, there's just not enough Gordon to make it happen. So the, the neatness of blockchain and technology is, yeah, just go, you know, fork and spin off into your own little zone. And you know what, the, 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 the vast communicativeness of these systems lets you do something like that and get noticed, unlike before. You know, you're not taking a piece of paper to throw into the wind. You're making, you know, it's out there digitally. People who want to find it, find it. And you find these micro communities. And then if the idea has legs, it's something not so micro anymore. And it takes on a life of its own. It's, it's sort of a beautiful thing. And people, you know, we made this comment on the couple of projects, you know, we're both touching. People phase in and out over time. People rise when they have something to offer and they kind of fall back when they don't. Or, you know, they get sick, they get better. You know, these things pixelate, but they move forward. Yeah. And... Yeah, in a, in a hierarchical structured system, it wouldn't necessarily happen. So it doesn't it doesn't happen, and and that's what's beautiful about open source and and crypto, you know. And just to to build on that, you know, I I've often talked about that as the difference between common law and civil law. It's mm. a bit of a simplification, but in common law, it's presumed you can do whatever you want as long as it's not prohibited by law, and in civil law, it's presumed that you can only do what is permitted. And I see this as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. um, all over the world, right? When I go to, you know, Austin or Seattle or, or Silicon Valley, nobody's asking for permission. They're just building, right? Presumably mm -hmm. they're not hurting or stealing from anyone. They're just, they can go and innovate. And when I go to civil law jurisdictions, you know what the entrepreneurs brag to me about? Tell me. We can be the first one to get permission. I know the minister within a year, maybe two, within a year or two, we're going to get permission to do this thing. Wow, that's a fascinating comment. Yeah, you're right. And so <laughs> you, you can look at the number of startups and concentrations, and you put a map of the world, and there are more in London than there are in the rest of Europe. Right? Number two is Berlin. Number three is Munich. There's a few other hot spots, but it's heavily concentrated in the only common law jurisdiction in Europe. Right, and you look at the United States. There's a lot of startups going on. You know, um, where is it done in Hong Kong? You know, in in Asia, it's in Hong Kong. It's in Singapore. It's these places that were built by common law, you know, jurisdictions. Right, that came in, and that fundamental difference is huge because, like you're saying, 
Nobody has the energy to fight the system and do the all reform. It goes back to the Bron Paul, right? What was his thing? Audit the Fed. We should have honest records of money. Like the guy spent his entire life work pretty much singularly focused on reforming this vast institution in the US. I don't know if he's any closer today than he was 50 years ago. And then I saw that and I said, instead, I'm going to opt out and I've now removed my money from the inflationary system and they could print as many, many dollars as they want. You're voting with your feet. Yeah, I'm voting with my feet, right? So those are vastly different outcomes. And so now you have a really permissionless system you know, in the form of DeFi and Ethereum and all these other protocols. And the people that still live physically in a jurisdiction that doesn't allow innovation all of a sudden have access, right? So you're seeing these massive waves mm -hmm. and they get tamped down, right? 2017, regulators came in the US, regulators came in in China. They said, nope, can't do that. I had friends in China who were there in Shanghai the next week they were in, in Singapore. Yeah. Vitalik didn't start in Switzerland. He no. was in Toronto, right? He started in Toronto. I thought it was in Florida, part of it. Yeah. He, was a, he, he announced Ethereum at the Miami Bitcoin conference in January of 2014, but he and a lot of the original crew, you know, Anthony and Trevor and all those guys, they were, they were in Toronto, right? They're in Canada, but they didn't start their foundation there because they couldn't. Right? Smart people mm -hmm. told them, you know, this is not going to be well received. If you're serious, you need to be in Switzerland. Right? And they followed in the footsteps of others like Monetas that set up in, in Crypto Valley even before Ethereum showed up. Right? And then the wave came after them, after their success. And so the serious players, I like to say in, in blockchain, you know, are North American technologists housed in friendly European jurisdictions and funded by Asian capital. Yep. That's okay, hold on. That, that was so beautiful. We're gonna end on that actually, because <laughs> I, I think we need to have you as a recurring guest. Just that was so good. Just say that again slowly. Just say it again. I, I like to joke that blockchain is a largely North American technologist housed in friendly European jurisdictions and funded by Asian capital. You know what? I've just adopted that as my life model. Thank you. My yep. life slogan. This is why I'm moving to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, David, really appreciate the time. This has been great. Uh, I, I think we're going to have more conversations, obviously. Um, you gave, you're very generous with your time and your thoughts. I like, I like the banter. So I, we're, we're going to call this one, and I am going to edit it and post it. So there you go. Sounds good. Thanks, right. Gordon. Talk to you in a little bit. Bye.